This is the lecture for Hisham Nar's Subject Relative Reasons for Love. So the first two topics we're going to cover are small sort of vocabulary topics, just uh, what does the article mean by these. Uh, I think one or both may have come up earlier uh, in some other readings, but uh, I think it helps to have them explained for this reading. So first on page three, he says, uh, two sets of considerations are usually offered in support of the no reasons view, one pre-theoretical, the other theoretical. Let us consider the pre-theoretical consideration first. These considerations appeal to linguistic use and folk intuitions about the nature of love. So what does this phrase folk intuitions mean? So in philosophy, for some reason, there's a convention for when you want to talk about sort of general ideas that people have, so not ideas that philosophers have, not ideas that are based on like science or studying or something, but just things that people generally believe just from growing up and having reasonable views about things. We call these uh, folk beliefs or folk intuitions or folk thoughts. We're sort of talking about what the folk think and the folk are just like, you know, normal people, everyday people. So why would we care about these? Um, I don't know, we might come to philosophy with the thought that broadly speaking, maybe we're not wrong about everything, so maybe the world as it appears to us is sometimes the way it is. Uh, and so, look, if you grow up thinking that the world is round, and that the sky is blue, and that fire is hot, and things like this, maybe you're right about some of these things, or most of these things. And so, it's often, many philosophers think, it's often not a bad idea to sort of start with sort of folk intuitions or folk beliefs about things. It's not that these must be right, you know, maybe everybody's wrong about some stuff, but we sort of start here, um, as he puts it, we sort of start at this pre-theoretical place and sort of say, let's at least use this as our starting point. Uh, uh, Nar doesn't really do that in this article, he sort of quickly discards this folk stuff, uh, he doesn't think it's very relevant. But uh, that's what people are talking about when they talk about appealing to folk stuff. I think this came up earlier in the Churchland reading a while back, um, but even more briefly, um, and it may have come up other times too. But that's just what this idea of folk stuff means. It's what typical people think or what people normally think. On page five in a footnote, uh, he's talking about a response to an objection and uh, he says, although this, although this kind of bullet biting might be ultimately successful, I will assume blah, blah, blah. So just what does bullet biting mean? Uh, this is another phrase that's kind of common in philosophy for some reason. And so to bite the bullet or uh, bullet biting is when you have some sort of theory or you have some sort of view and your theory has some sort of implication that's implausible or otherwise bad. So, for instance, uh, the first person to come up with the theory that uh, the world is round, you might think, well, that's implausible because the world looks flat, so how could it be round? Uh, and so to bite the bullet is to say, look, I get it. I accept that my theory has implausible re results, and I'm just going to say, <laughs> deal with it, okay? My theory is correct, and the implausible result is correct. My theory is that the Earth is round, and I it, I know it looks like it's flat, but actually it's round. Its appearances are deceiving. Just deal with it. So when you bite the bullet, you say, I accept that my theory has some sort of weird result, and I'm not going to try to get around that weird result. So we don't always bite the bullet in response to an objection. So um, if your theory uh, is that... <laughs> I should have come up with an example of this. Uh, before I started the lecture. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so if your theory is that humans evolved over time uh, from other species, and somebody says, 
oh, well, that implies that uh, we should see monkeys evolving into humans uh, today, and yet we don't see monkeys evolving into humans. That must be false. Uh, you could bite the bullet and say, yeah, I know my theory says we should see monkeys evolving into humans, but uh, I don't know, there's some reason we don't. Maybe it happens when we're not looking or whatever. But that's not what anybody actually does. What they say is, no, my theory doesn't imply that monkeys should be evolving into humans. Uh, I have a, like, that's not what evolution means. So we don't always bite the bullet when someone objects to the theory. In fact, often we don't. But uh, this is what it means to bite the bullet. You say, I know my theory has a weird result, and I'm just going to accept the result. I'm not going to try to get around it. I'm not going to say, my theory doesn't lead to the result. I'm going to say, yes, my theory leads to re the result, and deal with it. So that covers those vocabulary things. The next thing is still kind of a vocabulary thing, but it's also a philosophical point. Uh, on page 10, he talks about, uh, you know, for instance, being likely to cause physical harm, being likely to cause emotional pain, and being likely to kill all fall under the heading of the fearsome. We may say that they are all ways of being fearsome, or that being fearsome is a determinable of these more determinate properties, or that being fearsome is a second-order property of having first-order properties of a certain kind. So uh, what's this talk of second-order and first-order properties? So and what's this talk of first-order and second-order stuff generally? So uh, a first-order property is a property, so uh, the property of being likely to cause physical harm, being likely to cause emotional pain, being likely to kill. These are first order properties. Um, other examples are uh, being red, like this water bottle, um, being alive, like me, uh, being a computer, like a computer. So these are first order properties. And then second order properties are properties about properties. So, for instance, being fearsome would be a second-order property, according to Nott, because it's a property about other properties. So if something is likely to cause physical harm or likely to cause emotional pain or likely to kill, if it fits into one of those categories, then it is fearsome. So fearsome is about having certain first-order properties. So it's about those first-order things, so it's a second-order thing. and so. We use the language of first order and second order. You can imagine you have like down at the bottom the first order properties, and then the second order properties kind of like rest on top of those. They're built out of the first order properties. So they're on a higher level, they're on a different order because they sort of depend on the things below them, like a building, uh, the ground floor, or the first floor depends on the ground floor, and the second floor depends on the first floor. So the second order properties are sort of looking down on, they're sort of about the first order properties. And you could have third order properties and fourth order properties. You could just keep going up and up and up. And so generally talk about orders, like first order and second order, that's what's going on. A first order thing is sort of the basic thing. A second order thing is about the first order thing. And if there are third order and fourth order things, those are about the things below. Uh, and so that's just so you can understand what is going on here. This is philosophically relevant just because it's helpful to distinguish between uh, these sort of sorts of things in lots of contexts. So, uh, for instance, in this article, it's going to be helpful to distinguish between things that are sort of directly fearsome, things that like are liable to cause fear, and then the property of being fearsome, which is like a collection of these things, or having one or more of these things. And so it helps to be able to say, oh, fearsomeness is not the same sort of property as being likely to cause physical harm. It's not like when I'm listing out the first order properties of a thing, I say it's likely to cause me physical harm, and it's fearsome. Rather, Nahar suggests, if I'm being clear, when I'm listing out the properties, the first order property is likely to cause physical harm, then if I'm describing that property, I would say, oh, this thing is fearsome. Uh, but it's not like there's sort of two separate things. Rather, it's one thing described in two ways, one with the first order property and one with the second order. So the details of this will get more clear when you see what he's doing with this on page 10. 
when it comes to fear and love, uh, but this is just to highlight uh, the distinction.